here is the alphabet. Alif ba ta tha. Jim is for jihad. Hmm. Right. This is American. This is these are American funded textbooks right. that Afghan children were studying during the Soviet during invasion. the Soviet invasion. Yeah. Why to quote radicalize them into sure. fighting the Soviets? Yeah. Twelve years is not enough for that memory to be erased and come along and say, "Hey, actually, we kind of regret that whole jihad thing." Ahmed Walid Kakra, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and welcome to the Thinking Muslim. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you for having me. It's great to, it's a really an honor to have you with us. I've been thinking for some time to invite you. So, alhamdulillah, thank you for, for, for coming today. Now, for 20 years, the United States fought an unwinnable and ultimately a self defeating war in Afghanistan, only to withdraw in a humiliating way two years ago in 2021. The conflict ended what many saw as a colonial enterprise. Today, I want to explore that war, where it leaves Afghanistan, the geopolitics of the region. Afghanistan's relationship with Pakistan and the role of the Taliban. Many see this, see this austere Islamic group as classic freedom fighters, defeating the world's only superpower. But have they ultimately disappointed many in their time in government? The country suffers from poverty and is in near famine. So who is to blame for this terrible situation? So there's a lot to cover. My guest today, Ahmed Walid Kakar, is no stranger to the country. He's of Afghan descent. He is an analyst specializing in Afghan political history and a founder and editor-in-chief of the Afghan Eye, an independent media platform offering English language analysis of Afghan affairs. So Ahmed, when we watch the news, we see Afghanistan to be portrayed as a third world country with mud huts and children playing barefoot in the streets. Describe to me the country you know. Thank you very much for having me, Jalal. Um, the Afghanistan that I know is a country that was never really given the opportunity or allowed to develop its own approach toward governance, toward the outside world, mm. on its own terms, based on its own sanctities by the powers that be, whether those be foreign powers or whether they be domestic ideologues. The Afghanistan that I know uh, is a country in which those same barefooted children playing in and around mud huts were the ones that grew up to defy the designs of two superpowers within the past four decades. Mm -hmm. The Afghanistan that I know is largely functions as a canvas on which the fantasies and the aspirations of people of different ideological persuasions mm -hmm. project onto the country, failing to appreciate and understand the country for what it is on its own terms. Too often, those people from the outside projecting their ideas onto the country never really appreciate what the country is, but is always, you know, posited from the angle of what the country should be. Mm. The country that I know is one that picked honor and poverty over prosperity and enslavement. Right, and so enslavement meaning to the US forces and prior to that, as we said, to the Soviet Union. You've been to Afghanistan. Uh, I understand you visited the country during the occupation and of course uh, under Taliban rule. I mean, what's your interactions been like? What, what's your feeling uh, about the ordinary Afghan? How do they view what's happened over the last four decades, in particular over the last few years? Well, I mean, the term ordinary Afghan is, uh, can be taken to be pretty subjective. Mm. Generally speaking, I think across the country there is widespread relief right. that war is over. Okay. Uh, that saying that, you know, acknowledging that there are sporadic attacks by Daesh uh, groups of this sort, but by and large, if we're talking about war and conflict mm. between two sides with, you know, disparity of weapons notwithstanding, that has ceased. Yes. And now we have sporadic attacks. Mm. At the same time, however, there is widespread anxiety worry about what is a deteriorating economic situation precipitated by the end of the occupation. Uh, there are concerns as to what the Taliban's agenda for Afghanistan is, what their vision for Afghanistan is, and essentially what the ethos with which they s seek to approach the country, because as of yet, those are still very unclear. So you talk about the Taliban there. I mean, explain to me who the Taliban are and their history. 
Sure. So before we go into that discussion, I'm just going to say we, and I say this, we, myself, yourself, everyone listening, yeah. that when approaching Afghanistan and the Taliban, too often we sort of see, like you said in your introduction, you know, austere Islamic group, and on the other side, these backward force of darkness from the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages and all of the other sort of loaded terminology with which we're all familiar. Yeah. The Taliban, if we look at the actual name, the word Taliban from the Arabic, Talib means student. Now in the Afghan context, especially in the south of the country with which I have let's say some level of familiarity from which the Taliban emerged, your, refers... Your family are from the south. Exactly. The ta Talib refers specifically to a student of a religious seminary. So the, the Madraso Taliban, as we would say, the Taliban of the Madrasa. Mm -hmm. So the Taliban are a social political group very deeply ingrained within the political social fabric of the South, mm -hmm. to the extent that not only does the word Talib have apolitical connotations, mm -hmm. but you know it's, it's often seen in graduation ceremonies, let's say, from these religious Seminar, seminaries from these madaris mm -hmm. that the graduation entails the tying of a turban mm -hmm. on the, the head of a student that has let's say completed the hif of the quran mm -hmm. right so all of these things sort of come together in a very apolitical sense prior to the formation of the modern political social group as we know it yeah. if you look at the manuscripts and the records of the british from the late 19th century they also refer in one of the defeats that they sustained at the hands of the Afghans in, 18, uh, in the 1880s, they'll talk about wild-eyed Ghazis from the religious seminaries. Yeah. Those wild-eyed Ghazis were what were the Taliban of that day. Mm. Now that's the background. If we're talking about the political organization, the Taliban, like, like I said, emerging from these madaris, were founded in 1994 by a figure called Mullah Omar or Mullah Omar Mujahid. Mujahid meaning that he actually fought and was active in duty fighting against the Russians as part of one of the seven Mujahideen groups of the time. Right. At the time following the Russian withdrawal, we had a period where the communist regime lasted until 92, which was succeeded by a civil war. The Taliban organized themselves after two years of civil war to essentially try to remove what was a pretty bad situation in Afghanistan. The country had been almost carved up into rival principalities. The capital, Kabul itself, was itself divided between different warring parties. And so the Taliban, because they had not lost the political capital that the Mujahideen had enjoyed and thus lost following their descent into civil war, the Taliban were able to co-opt many other Mujahideen factions and commanders, ultimately taking Kabul. Well, they took Kandahar, then they took Herat, then they took Kabul, Jalalabad and Mazar-e-Sharif in 1998. That is the organization that we know yeah. that was toppled from power in 2001. What makes up the Taliban's ideology? I mean, we hear a lot about the Taliban being a group that adopts Delbandi Hanafi fiqh. And one of the uh, very apparent objections the Taliban have uh, is towards women uh, working, but also women uh, being educated. So they've banned, as far as I understand it, the ban still remains for university and school students in Afghanistan. Explain that to me. Explain the ideology of, of the Taliban. So you've correctly pointed out the sort of the Hanafi, the Diobandi uh, connection that Afghanistan as a country itself, even the non-Taliban, even the non-Pashtuns, we could say, overwhelmingly a Sunni country, roughly, we could there hasn't been any official census conducted, so we're going off general estimates. We're talking roughly about 80 to 85% Sunni, yeah. within which overwhelmingly almost all adhere to the Hanafi school okay. of thought. Yeah. Now, the overlap with Deoband is thus very natural and organic. Mm. Now, the Taliban's ideology is one that is formed uh, based on their own cultural experience in the south yeah. of the country, as well as their exposure to the Madaris of Deobandi Dio Madaris in Pakistan, foremost amongst them being the Darul Ulum Haqqaniya. Mm -hmm. Now, what I want to say here is that I don't want to ca categorize all Deobandis as sort of being, uh, have harboring antipathy toward being, toward women being educated or outside of the house. Mm 
But generally speaking, in the south of Afghanistan, the way that the culture and the economy and the society is generally functioned is that women's role is very much overwhelmingly indoors. Mm. Now, that's not the case for all Pashtuns, okay. right? Uh, if you look at traditionally nomadic Pashtun communities in Afghanistan, obviously because they were nomads, women had much more of an active role in economic exchange, mm. right? In the east of the country, similarly, the non-Pashtun communities, obviously you can't categorize them all, but they wouldn't have the same sort of approach. Now, the Taliban, because their cultural experience is one in which women being outdoors is something that's sort of uncommon, yeah. uh, that lends itself to how they interpret what we call orf, which is the prevalent custom within a culture or a society which is taken into account when arriving at legal Islamic judgments. Mm. Now, I don't, I don't want to say that th there's also another point here with respect to women's education is that I wouldn't say that this is entirely one that is based in scripture or an interpretation of scripture. Yeah. I think, I, and I wrote about this on the Afghan eye, uh, I wrote quite a lengthy article as well, that education itself, both for men and for women, has been politicized since the dawn of, in, of its introduction into Afghanistan. We're talking about sec secular, modern Western education. And whether that be in the 1920s attempts at socially engineering Afghanistan, along the same lines as Ataturk's Turkey, uh, whether that be during the Soviet occupation, whether that be teachers or Soviet uh, communist leaders literally being former teachers in the state apparatus, whether that be Cheryl Bernard talking about the importance of education in weakening traditionalists and strengthening modernists and secular secularists within Muslim majority countries. There's a very clear trajectory, not just in the Muslim world, but magnified within Afghanistan of education being something of a minefield. As, and that goes hand in hand with to what extent women are outside of the house or indoors, to what extent can they have a public role. Mm. All of those things together, that sort of suspicion with which the outside world is viewed and all of the technologies and everything that's imported into Afghanistan has a very profound effect in how modern education for women from grade 6 to 12 and university is viewed, especially at the higher echelons of the Taliban hierarchy. I mean, OK, I understand, but I understand that there is this antipathy towards education as a as a way by which Western ideologies penetrate Afghan society. But the Taliban are now in government, so they have the opportunity to change that and to develop an education system which is uh, based on Islamic principles or based on, you know, a sense of neutrality that maybe didn't exist when Westerners interfered in the country, when the Soviets interfered in, in, the, in the country. I mean, surely they should recognize that in any society, in any functioning society, there needs to be teachers and doctors and nurses and others, you know, men and women, who are able to serve the different segments of the society. I mean, has that, do people question the Taliban government and explain that need? I think... Uh, in th if you take them at their word, in theory, none of them uh, opposes the fact that there need to be women doctors. Okay. Uh, in theory, and that that is something that is not insignificant. Really? That in theory, on paper, yeah, there is the acceptance and the admission that yes, we do need women working in, let's say, practical jobs. Oh, so this is interesting. So they don't say that scripturally, from yes. a from a fiqh perspective, women full stop cannot work. Yes. They say that actually it's allowed or, or more than allowed for mm -hmm. women to work for these necessary. So there's yeah. actually a very interesting anecdote here. So one of the things, so you asked uh, about the prominence of this issue in Afghanistan. And we can say observing the Afghan sort of Afghan media, Afghan social, social media, mm. the political pronouncements made by politicians, yeah. the Taliban we're talking about here. It is probably at the highest of agendas. Now... One thing that was very illuminating, and it's an anecdote which I'll relate to you, mm -hmm. is that the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Sheikh Mohammed Abbas Tanakzai, who was the head of the Doha political office, uh, in one, it, uh, it was the anniversary of the death, the death anniversary rather, of the former Taliban leader, wherein he said that we've achieved X, Y, Z, we've done a fantastic job, our country is now independent, and now we need to create a system whereby we can flourish, meaning education. Mm -hmm. And he said that education is fard or obligatory upon men and women. Really? He said that. Right. 
Now that was followed by a subsequent speech of the Minister for the Propagation of Virtue and the Prevention of Vice, who said that education for men and women is mubah, or allowed, permissible. All right. However, the Amir has the it is the Amir's prerogative to suspend or issue a moratorium on that which is uh, allowed, mm. meaning that it's obedience to the Amir comes higher on the list of priorities than what is allowed and permissible. Yeah. Now that same event was very illustrative of what the actual divide was. On one hand, you had, let's say someone who's, and I don't like using the term moderate versus extremist or hardliner. We'll get into that later yeah. as well. Yeah. But you had a very clear sort of dichotomy of views where one person was saying, representing one current or one trend within the movement, mm -hmm. saying that it's fart upon men and women and the other saying, well, it's permissible, but if the Amir decides it's not going to happen, we have to obey the Amir first. Yeah. So I'm struggling to understand why the Amir has made that blanket rule. Um, what is the rationale at this moment? Even if they say, if he believes it's Mubar, what is the rationale at this moment to, to stop all education? Is it they're trying to, I don't know, reconfigure schools? Uh, what, what's, yeah. Well, uh, there are numerous theories. So that let's go with what the current government in Afghanistan said. For, at first, they said there was the initial period of, of about five, six months where schools were closed. And they mm -hmm. said, well, we're just going to figure out the correct Islamic environment, which is sufficiently segregated and the girls' uniforms and everything. Right. All of these things are sort of addressed. So practical issue. Practical okay. issues, right? right? And I want, once again, the issue of the girls' uniform itself illustrates to what extent women's appearance in the public sphere is politicized mm. because what we've had in Afghanistan, of, especially over the course of the past four decades, is the woman is figuratively dressed and undressed based on which current is in power. Mm. And the figure of the woman itself, the dress itself, has become a political football, right? right? So the issues initially were said to be practical. And then on the day, the 23rd of March, 2022, the day that girls' schools were opened, girls went to school, they were told that up until further notice, they'd be closed. And we've heard a variety of different explanations. Right. And then ultimately the truth started to come out, however, indirectly. So um, Anas Haqqani, for example, said that, uh, I believe this was last year in about June, he said something along the lines of a gathering of ulama will come and talk and decide upon this issue, yeah. which comes back to the topic why do the ulama need to discuss it, right? So it's obviously not just about the timetable or the uniform or whatever. There's something much more significant here, yeah. right? And we've had sort of vague promises at various junctures as with respect to this issue being solved soon. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, and this is probably the most uncomfortable thing for many to hear, mm -hmm. we don't actually know. Um, we can go by the Chief Justice's book, which I spoke about in my article, um, but ultimately, it could be you. It could potentially uh, be thought of as a political tool for negotiations with the West. Yeah, there is that. I don't personally think that that is plausible. Yeah, there is the issue of now that the issue has become so prominent, it's metastasized beyond just women in schools. Okay. Now it's become, you know, a political Sorry. position. Yeah. It's become a political position within the cabinet itself. Okay. Who's going to want to stand on this issue? Who's going to give concessions? Because, right. you know, the Taliban, whilst, you know, they're an Islamic group and a lot of scholars are in their ranks, right. there are hu they are human beings as well. And the human being is a political animal. This itself is a political position whereby even if, theoretically speaking, one member of cabinet is not opposed to it, yeah. he may not want to acquiesce to their reopening. And then finally, there's the issue of the Chief Justice's book, which is significant in the sense that it is thus far the clearest indication of or the clearest layout of what the Taliban's vision for Afghanistan is. Mm. And if we read the Chief Justice's book, he's not just doesn't harbor antipathy toward women in modern education. He has antipathy toward men in modern education. Really? Uh, with the caveat that he does concede modern education is necessary, right. but only to fulfill the objectives of the world, of the dunya. Right. Right. But I believe there's actually a quote in that book where he says that for every hour studied in worldly education, 
two hours should be devoted to religious education. Okay. So, but ultimately, if someone is going to study the modern sciences and partake in the economy, yeah. is it going to be the women or is it going to be the men? Right. According to the Chief Justice's worldview, yeah. it's not going to be the women. Also, we know that when the uh, Taliban were in government in the 1990s, uh, they set up a ministry, the Ministry for, uh, for Communicator or Endorsing all that is good, Amr bil Ma'ruf, Amr bil Ma'ruf. Um, and uh, I understand that ministry has been once again set up. It was set up after the defeat of the Americans. Now, in the 90s, we knew that the, the Taliban were characterized by you know, banning, for example, uh, shaving of the beards, or if your beard was not of a particular length, you could be flogged for that. Uh, oddly enough, they banned the flying of kites, which I want to understand, you know, maybe you've got a reason why they, they did that. But there were lots of, they banned the TV, they banned, you know, um, a musical instruments. So there was a lot that they banned during that first period. I suppose I want to understand why they went that far to intervene in the personal lives of people. And does that still exist today? So I'll answer the latter question first, which yeah. is that by and large, we've seen much more maturity okay. this time around with respect to that. So whilst uh, there have been directives and edicts issued, essentially instructing women to cover their faces, mm. um, things of the sort, the implementation and the enforcement has been very lax. Okay. Um, and it's very important to understand that there is a very strong, let's say, pressure group from within the Taliban that want to see those sorts of things being enforced. So right. we had the former governor of Kabul province, Kabul being the capital, so mm -hmm. the governor of Kabul province is going to be a man of some significance and stature. Right. He's now the minister of higher education who also signed into effect what he said is the moratorium on girls' education. Right. Sheikh Al Hadith Nida Muhammad Nadim. Now there there was a video clip going around from his time of the governorship of Kabul where he said that it pained him going around Kabul and seeing the faces of women being uncovered. Mm. Once again, this isn't someone who's insignificant. That being said, however, um, the implementation has been rather lax. So what it seems that the current government is doing is essentially on paper enshrining or enjoining what is good, telling people what the right thing to do is. The good thing to do is, but the actual implementation is much more lax. Right. Coming to the first part of... If I can come back to you, why? Why are they far more... Are they aware of international public opinion? Actually, as early as 2007 and eight, there were reports from Hilmand in the South mm. that they were being much more lax with respect to the lengths of beards mm. because they've gained an appreciation as to how unpopular that had made them domestically in, in, okay. within Afghanistan. Yeah. So they're probably not going to be as sensitive to international pressure as they are to unpopularity at home. Right. So that was as early as 2007 and 2008. Yeah. Now coming back to the late mm. 90s, mm. uh, one of the things that was actually striking about how they governed Afghanistan was they almost, there was almost this ethos of trying to punish the city and the urban folk who were seen as being degenerate, okay. sinful, right. wrongdoers, yeah. who, you know, through their deviant or corrupt ideologies had brought the USSR to Afghanistan. And now, as opposed to the urban ruling the rural, the rural was now back in, th in the city to enforce, and to some extent, to discipline yeah. what had been the excesses of the urban uh, inhabitants. We haven't really seen that that much this right. time. And one of the reasons I would suggest that could potentially explain that is that you have had more exposure toward urban Afghanistan from the Taliban, right. which has also resulted in some sort of, let's say, evolution in how they consider their urban compatriots. I mean, they effectively set up a pseudo uh, embassy in Doha uh, during the occupation. And that was a deal that was struck with the United States as a way of sort of uh, paving the way for these uh, peace negotiations. I mean, did that time in Doha affect the way they saw government and Islamic rule? Amongst those whom we could refer to colloquially as the shot callers, okay. I wouldn't say so. Right. And the shot callers remained in Afghanistan. The shot callers okay. remained in Afghanistan. Right. And those shot callers 
by virtue of the fact that they're calling the shots and we can see the shots in terms of policy whilst they have mold you know adapted to certain uh policy issues to others like the girls schools they've remained very firmly in place that being said however i think with in terms of in generally uh, keeping with the general theme of how they viewed the urban population of Afghanistan that has evolved and there's also been sort of an an interchange between urban and rural Afghanistan with respect to that i think inadvertently the united states actually facilitated that with the proliferation of communications the internet right. mobile phones signal and all of that sort of thing yeah. they were actually the average rank and file talib was much more able e- easily able to see what was going on in the urban centers mm-hmm. and whilst there was what well, the average talib would consider a massive amount of moral corruption going mm-hmm. on yeah. they were very clearly able to see that the bulk of the urban population remained as they saw practicing and good muslims oh that's interesting so during the uh, rule of the americans did the americans not try to westernize the country uh, beyond uh you know modernizing it i mean you know westernize it from a liberal perspective of course i mean one of the key things that we can see was a very active attempt at social engineering really um as fierce as the soviet attempts well no because if we uh i don't want to per- quote any dictators internationally but yeah. the, there's the whole ngo complex that comes attached with the americans that whereas the soviets would obviously prefer more of a brute force Indeed, approach yeah, yeah. but a lot of these ngos operated very opaquely yeah. and were essentially accessory tools for the americans to achieve their goals and their objectives in reorganizing afghan society right. one of for example one very clear example of social engineering is the requirement that amongst the members of the afghan parliament a certain number had to be women never you know before had that been a requirement right. stipulated by law yeah. in a country that's and i don't mean to say pejoratively but a patriarchal country in yeah. which leadership is seen as something that is exclusively the realm of men yeah women being in parliament and a certain number yeah. being stipulated a quota a quota right. almost not just the ethnicity aspect of the quota system but also the gender aspect is probably uh, we could go on and on and on mm-hmm. but that i think that's pretty telling in and of itself yeah i mean some of these objections or, or points that i've raised about schooling about you know i'm a really mad uh obviously a lot of it is proliferates in the western press and i'm mu- very much aware that i'm echoing some of the criticisms that the westerners uh, levy at the taliban i mean how much are you sensitive to uh you know to that you know because a lot of this is how the west still carry on beating the taliban in afghanistan well i i, I in your first question when you asked me about what kind of country do i know i alluded to this and i said that too often afghanistan is sort of seen not as the country that is but as the country that it should be and too often i wouldn't even say too often i'd say almost exclusively yeah. the western media coverage of afghanistan is predicated on the assumption that afghanistan should be a liberal democracy or act like it yeah and we have to ask ourselves why mm-hmm. is that a good thing is democracy inherently good mm-hmm. especially for a country like afghanistan and assuming that it is mm-hmm. is such a thing feasible mm-hmm. now the reality is is that within the consent manufacturing industry that is mainstream media coverage of afghanistan the occupation military physical of afghanistan may have ended but the global infrastructure underpinning that occupation is very much intact and in place and by virtue of the taliban's policies and them u turning or breaking their promises on certain things that global infrastructure we could almost say is actually strengthened but the pro- the problem that we have is is that no one is beyond reproach critical criticism and if we are going to criticize the taliban as we should on a variety of different issues the criticism can either be for criticism's sake or it should be in the hope that something constructive comes out of it yeah. and if we want to go the latter route where something constructive is to emerge from this criticism we need to be criticizing them on terms that are familiar to them and to the people that they rule over in afghanistan right. you can't be criticizing them on a moral framework yeah. against which they fought for 20 years so from an islamic from standpoint. an islamic standpoint if afghan culture, culture. is playing a yeah. role here 
from an Afghan cultural standpoint. Right. But it's absolute absurdity to expect that after fighting against the imposition of a Western philosophical moral framework in Afghanistan, mm. that they're now suddenly going to be sensitive and, you know, heed uh, concerns and considerations according to that framework. Mm. There's uh, There was discussion just before uh, the humiliating withdrawal, and I think we can call it a humiliating withdrawal of Biden and, and the Americans, that the Taliban had these moderate elements and as, you know, these ex so-called extreme or fanatical elements. And uh, the West were quite reassured with those meetings they had at Doha. Now, I know you you describe those people who were involved in that. They were not necessarily the higher tier of, of, of the Taliban. But how much, uh, how exaggerated is this? I mean, is this a true depiction that there is a, you've talked about that, you know, the the divisions within the Taliban over we women uh, over girls going to school. Is there a, you know, a tussle, a tension between these two sides, however we label them? So what's interesting is that those who were considered extremist yeah. prior to the withdrawal mm. are now considered moderate <laughs> by virtue of their, let's say, and I don't want to use the term, relatively more permissive stances toward women in education. Okay. Key example being um, Sirajuddin Haqqani, the current minister yeah. uh, of interior very of Afghanistan. Very controversial, of course. A very controversial yeah. figure, I believe still on the American blacklist, yeah. has a bounty on his head yeah. due to his uh, links, alleged or real, with Al-Qaeda, is now considered a moderate and is preferred by international diplomats because his ministry employs women he is known to be an advocate for women's education and women's right to work. Okay. So once again, if we're using a foreign philosophical framework mm. to project onto Afghanistan and judge Afghanistan according to, okay. these are the sorts of squares that are going to need circling repeatedly. Mm. Sirajuddin Haqqani, crazy terrorist fanatic, mm. very scary, no real picture of him. Mm. The name invoked fear in people, the Haqqani network, the Haqqani network. Yeah is now, you know, they, they obviously can't come out and say, hey, we like this guy, but is actually permissive in certain things, mm. right? So when we're talking about who's conservative and who's extremist, we need to be once again reorienting the discussion according to our terms, our sanctities, and our moral framework. Mm. Now, with respect to the people that were in the Doha office, I don't want to say that they are not powerful. There were certainly very powerful people there. Yeah. However, that power, ultimately, when it comes to the ethos that binds the movement together, yeah. becomes null and void because it is uh, relegated yeah. to the obedience to the Amir. Yeah. So no matter how Sirajuddin Haqqani, we were uh, speaking of him, was uh, often considered to be the brains behind the Taliban and the real ruler. Mm -hmm. And now we know that he's actually in favor of women's education, but he as of yet, has not prevailed on the Amir. Right. And once again, obedience to the Amir takes front uh, front and center stage. I mean, that's a, it's a really interesting setup. I mean, you don't find that very much with Islamic organizations, that level of obedience to the Amir. I mean, it's admirable in a way that, you know, they have a coherent decision-making structure and they don't seem to be splitting into many splinter groups. I mean... Is that a is that a good way to characterize Taliban? I would, yeah, yeah, I, I definitely. And there were numerous attempts uh, during the occupation to once again, by by virtue of the fact that something called the Haqqani Network mm. had gained international notoriety, mm. was a very active attempt uh, at trying to split off the Haqqanis or to at least portray them as being different yeah. uh, to the Taliban and not falling within the overall remit. Yeah. Uh, in my interview with Anas Haqqani, yeah. that was uh, published for New Lines magazine, uh, I spoke to him and he actually told me, according to him, this is the younger brother of Sirajuddin Haqqani, that his father, mm. Jalaluddin Haqqani, mm. was actively courted by the Americans to abandon the Taliban fight. Yeah. So attempts at playing politics and dividing the Taliban very much characterized the course of the past uh, 20 years. And ultimately, as we can see, the Americans and the now former Afghan regime ended up being more divided than the Taliban. Why did the Americans fail in Afghanistan? 
I think ultimately in Afghanistan, legitimacy matters a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, whilst often characterized and caricatured as sort of a primitive society wherein political norms are unimportant and dismissed uh, or easily dismissed on the basis of personal whims, I think ultimately it comes down to um, legitimacy. The Afghan, if you look at the genesis of the Afghan national identity in the modern world and within the paradigm of nation states, the Afghan national identity, and like all know, someone can say that these are myths and whatever, par for the course when it comes to all national myths. The national identity of Afghanistan was very much formulated according to Islam and according to or forged by the circumstances of foreign invasion, mm. principally the British. The, Afghan, the modern Afghan state that came out of the ashes of a previous Afghan empire was very much characterized by an inherent suspicion towards British and Russian imperialism mm. and as a result of fighting against British imperialism actively. Prior to the Americans coming to Afghanistan, the Americans came in what, 2001. Mm. The Russians left in 1989. So there's a 12-year gap between them, which if we think is not actually that long. Mm. I mean, 12 years ago was what, 2011. We think of Tahrir Square, for example. Absolutely. We think of what happened in Syria. Now, within during the Russian invasion, the Americans bankrolled the Afghan Mujahideen, even sent textbooks to Afghan children studying in Peshawar and other refugee camp across refugee camps in Pakistan with curricula that said things like here is the alphabet alif ba ta tha jim is for jihad hmm. right this is american this is these are american funded textbooks right. that afghan children were studying during the soviet during invasion. the soviet invasion yeah. why to quote radicalize them into sure. fighting the soviets yeah 12 years is not enough for that memory to be erased and come along and say Hey, actually, we kind of regret that whole jihad thing. You, jim is now. Uh, yeah, yeah, jim is now for. Janet. <laughs> there, there we go. Exactly. <laughs> and ultimately, if we look at, I refer to Afghan history. What we have in, in Afghanistan, one of our preeminent historical documents, is a royal chronicle that was commissioned in the early 20th. I'm just going to take a brief detour. Please, there's a point yeah. that I make yeah. here. We have a royal chronicle that was commissioned in the early 20th century by the Amir Habibullah okay. called Siraj al Tawarikh, right? Meaning the light, the lamp of history or histories. Now, in referring to the Amir Dost Muhammad, mm -hmm. it said so Amir Dost Muhammad was deposed by the British in 1839. Mm -hmm. The British occupied Afghanistan for three years in 1842. After their occupation, Dost Muhammad came back from his British Indian exile and took his throne in Kabul once more. Mm. Siraj al Tawarikh, prior to the, so the Royal Chronicle, the state history of Afghanistan at the time, prior to the British invasion, referred to Dost Muhammad solely as the Amir of Kabul. Mm. Okay? The Amir of Kabul. Mm. And then it details the course of the British invasion and occupation. And then it talks about his return to Kabul. Upon his return to Kabul, Siraj al Tawarikh refers to him as Amir al Kabir. Okay? Even though at the time he had just come back to take the governorship of Kabul, mm. he didn't rule over the entirety of the country. Mm. So he ruled the same territory, if not shrunk, with less resources, with a broken state apparatus. But now the question becomes how did he go from Amir al Kabul to Amir al Kabir? The fact that there was a British invasion that was fought against and defeated. That's just one illustrative example that I want to use that the, the embryo of the Afghan national identity mm. well, maybe perhaps at the time Dost Muhammad was not considered Amir Kabir, but at least according to the royal chronicle that sought to inculcate a national identity within the masses, mm. that was what it used. The fact that the British invasion had vindicated what was previously Kabul's governor to a great and a grand and a lofty Amir. Mm. That Within that sort of historical paradigm, if you are the George Bush or Barack Obama, you're largely held prisoner to the confines of Afghan national and political history. And the Taliban are uniquely placed to claim the mantle once again of Afghan resistance against the foreign occupier. And that is ultimately, uh, to be colloquial, how, as they say, the cookie crumbles. In addition to that, if we're talking about legitimacy, going beyond just 
the fact that this is a military occupation by a foreign non-Muslim superpower, the actual human resources that were employed in terms of fulfilling the goals of this occupation were people that were largely discredited, people that had destroyed Kabul in the civil war from 1992 to 1996, people that, and especially this is very pertinent in Afghanistan, people that had committed crimes of honor, such as rape, right? right? If we're talking about Mujahideen fi sabidullah, then they go and rape in, an inter, uh, in a war amongst each other. Yeah. These are people whose reputations never actually recovered. Yeah. And they were yet brought back by the Americans who were now singing the song of democracy and human rights yeah. and putting in power and paying people in black bags who had violated democracy and human rights. Um, those are, we could dedicate an entire podcast series to how they yeah, failed. The, how they failed, but ultimately yeah. the crux of the Afghan national story, yeah. whether real or fabricated or exaggerated, yeah. as well as the human resources that were tasked with fulfilling the goals of the occupation, ultimately uh, led to the demise from the very beginning, I would say, of the American mission in Afghanistan. But the American installed government just had very little legitimacy amongst ordinary Afghans. Um, we know that Barack Obama decided that he was going to employ what he called the troop surge, and that ultimately failed, or well, obviously failed. And uh, Donald Trump comes along, and uh, I hate to say this, but it seems like he had the better sense of most of the, the presidents. You know, he, he decided that it's time to bring the troops back, and uh, the war was just a useless, useless conflict. Um, you know, in his words, we got bin Laden, we... That's it. You know, we, we need to now leave leave the country. Um, why did it take so long for the presidents, even Barack Obama, by the end of it, came to the conclusion that this was an unwinnable conflict? I mean, you know, he's, he's, he's man on the ground. And, you know, even uh, Hillary Clinton was said to have had uh, major doubts about, uh, about the operation towards the end. He, he's Secretary of State. Why did it take so long for them to extricate themselves from Afghanistan? I think ultimately it comes down to legitimacy uh, and these are quest a question of legitimacy and how things are perceived ultimately have very serious material ramifications. The, during the Obama uh, administration, we saw a shift in rhetoric where they were talking about a negotiated end to the conflict amongst all Afghan parties. Okay. But now this is when, this, this is how the tables turn, as they say, initially there were no negotiations. You're with us and against us, whereas the Taliban were reportedly amenable to negotiations that was rejected out of hand, both by the US and their local stooges. By 2010, however, the Taliban were saying, well, if you want to negotiate, we're here, but we're not negotiating with those guys that you put in Kabul, Yes. right? And why, theoretically speaking, would they? Yeah. If the precondition for any negotiation is you countenancing the prospect of withdrawal, I have no business with those guys in Kabul. You put them there. The moment you go, they will collapse. Right. And as it turns out, you know, we can fault their policy positions, mm -hmm. but as it turns out, they weren't entirely wrong. And the Americans were very hesitant, especially under Obama, yeah. very reluctant to pull the rug out from the Afghan regime that they themselves had installed. So they stalled and they opened an office in Doha yeah. and indirect talks were held. And by the way, the same thing was done uh, in uh, opposition to the Taliban by the Afghan regime of Ashraf Ghani. Mm. What happened was that the same rationale uh, drove Ashraf Ghani initially, where he thought, if I reach out to Pakistan and I manage to come to a mutual understanding with them, mm. then I have no need to negotiate with the Taliban because once I pull the rug out from under their feet, they will automatically be amenable to negotiations. Mm. But as we saw, that isn't exa exactly what happened and the news broke that Mullah Omar had died. So ultimately, uh, and this is something that features very prominently in the domestic Afghan discourse, which is that you negotiated with, addressed to the Taliban, you, you negotiated with the Americans and not with us. Mm. Taliban turn around and say, well, you were guilty of basically the same thing. And we just had the greater power to negotiate with your foreign patron. So ultimately, this is what happens in proxy wars. Um, but I think Trump was just a lot less sensitive to any reputational risk uh, the United States might incur than Obama yeah. ever was. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, so when 
they finally did leave. Of course, it was a, a botched operation, and, and uh, many America, a number of American troops died in, in uh, ISIS in an ISIS uh, bomb, and um, it it tend it just went very wrong for the Biden administration, and reputationally for Biden, he could never recover his personal ratings after that. Did the Americans really believe? I and mean, this is a superpower that they have you know, intelligence on the ground everywhere. Did they really believe that the Ghani government would remain for a period of time and fight the good fight uh, to the very end? Well, it seems that, according to Secretary of State Blinken, um, not long before the collapse of Ghani's regime, he was promising that he would fight until the end. He was promising that, yes. really. But I feel that, and I think it's very important that Things are recognized for what they are. And politics oftentimes is a zero-sum game in which material benefit is often the primary driver and motivator. Yeah. I find that the stigmatization of Ghani is very much and largely motivated by the desire to sort of alleviate any sort of reputational risk. So he the was United the man to States. blame rather than Exactly. US. Well, okay. why couldn't Ghani be like Zelensky? <laughs> right when this is something that we've had, I'm sure, a T-shirt wouldn't. Exa see exactly, I, d I definitely agree. But ultimately speaking, if you are Ashraf Ghani, the question becomes: Why would you fight? Right. So you come into power on the basis of, let's say, certain promises that the Americans will help you against the Taliban. Mm -hmm. The Americans cut you out of the Americans acquiesce to the Taliban. Yeah. Cut you out of negotiations legitimize the Taliban, inversely delegitimizing yourself. The meetings are held behind closed doors, the details of which you don't really have a great idea. You sign an agreement, the details of which you had no input in, and then you are told, well, just go along with it. There's, you know, I'm not, obviously, I, ver I very much criticized Ashraf Ghani at the time for not complying with the Doha agreement, but that was because like many Afghans, we saw the writing on the wall. Right. His time was done, and he saw that as well. So yeah. if his time was done, why would he stay and fight? Yeah, that makes rational sense. And ultimately, yeah. ultimately what he did, you could it could be interpreted as spiting the United States, which is, well, if you're going to do, if you're going to pursue that course of action, mm. I'm not going to give you what you want either. Mm. Right? And ultimately, of course, it's a selfish thing to do. It wasn't in the Afghan national interest that he did that. For example, we were hearing that there was supposed to be a formal transition ceremony where power would be handed over to a transitional government headed by the Taliban or whatever. Okay. That never materialized. And as a result of that, Afghanistan fell under sanctions. And that abruptness between these two governments is something that's caused, I don't want to say a crisis of legitimacy, but internationally has had ramifications. Could it have been any different? Potentially. But we'll never know. But what Ghani did ultimately was selfish, but the question becomes, well, why wouldn't he? Ahmed, what would you say to someone who would be listening to today's interview and, and maybe follows the Afghan eye and, and comes to the conclusion that uh, Ahmed is really just pro-Taliban, um, uh, but he wears a blazer and he speaks in English language. Are you pro-Taliban? and how, how do you characterize your analysis? I would say that when we first started the Afghan eye, in the English language, you've read Chomsky's Manufacturing Consent. The discussion was with respect to Afghanistan and the English language specifically had its set parameters. You could criticize the corruption that was endemic to the whole enterprise from the very beginning. You could criticize, let's say, this warlord's human rights record in the civil war of the 90s. You could criticize, let's say, the politicization of ethnicity and so on. Yeah. You could even criticize, right, very generously, the civilian casualties that uh, resulted from the American occupation. Yeah. But what you could not do was emerge out of these parameters and ask, as an Afghan, why do we need tens of thousands of American troops in our country? Yeah. You couldn't really ask as an Afghan based on, let's say, Afghan national interests, is it in our interests that we do so? How is it possible that 
we pride ourselves, and loads of people in the government were former Mujahideen from the 80s, right? Is it, how is it possible that ex-politician is the brother of a Mujahid from the 80s? That was a jihad, that was sanctioned religiously, but this is not. Something is not squaring up. So my question is that, ultimately, all media platforms, all personalities, all journalists, everyone has their biases. If you go, for example, I think it's the, the Washington Post that's written, democracy dies in the dark, yes. right? Dies in darkness. Dies in darkness. Yes. The basis of that statement is formed by the understanding that democracy is good. Mm. That is an explicit political position. Everyone has an explicit political position. No one is unbiased. And ours was very much predicated on the premise that occupation is not good for Afghanistan. Yeah. It wasn't good when the British tried occupying us. It certainly wasn't good when the Soviets tried occupying us. Mm -hmm. I speak for myself personally here. My father was in his best army, Gulbuddin Hikmatyar. Mm -hmm. I've been completely transparent about that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't good in the 80s and it's not good now. Mm -hmm. And there are other ways to go forth. With respect to the Taliban, they pr probably agree with me on that. But when it comes to policy positions, right, women's education or You've many critical, other different things, yeah. I don't see uh, much of a common ground between us. Okay. Well, let's talk about one uh, such possible criticism. Uh, recently, I mean, last week, there was a joint meeting between the Pakistani government, the Taliban and uh, the Chinese. And uh, the consequence, the result of the meeting was to, uh, to, to sign an initial agreement to, to give uh, contracts to Chinese drilling companies. Now, Afghanistan has enormous untapped mineral and oil resources. And, and I think that uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of studies to say that, um, you know, in particular for raw, raw earths, rare earths, uh, Afghanistan is a, is a gold mine. Um, how do you assess this relationship between the Taliban government and the Chinese? So what we've seen over uh, the past nearly two years uh, since the end of the occupation and the resumption of the Taliban's time in government is an interesting dialectic that's emerged between Kabul on the one hand and Beijing on the other, mm -hmm. whereby statements are made with respect to engagement, with respect to cooperation, with respect to economic recovery and development, counter-terrorism, and so on and so forth, but very little actual action, especially when it comes on the economic front. Right. Uh, I'm going to take this moment to actually uh, mention Jeff Rigsby on Twitter. His at is Jeff Rigsby2. Uh, he's an American, he was a former contractor for the US Air Force during the occupation, yeah. now living in Afghanistan. Uh, and I'd say he probably has better investigative journalism skills than most really? investigative he's an journalists. He's independent journalist. He's an independent. Yeah. He's. I, I don't believe he calls himself a journalist, but he lives okay. in Afghanistan. Oh, wow. Okay. We could say as an analyst. Yeah. Now, one thing that so he's elucidated these uh, topics uh, in his threads much better than I have and can. Yeah. But essentially, what we see are these declarations of this contract being signed but very little action following. Right. Or we see declarations made from Kabul that are not followed by correspondent declarations of a contract being signed in Beijing. Even though there are gatherings in which the Chinese ambassador to Kabul is present. Mm -hmm. Now, what, it, what can we read from that? First of all, it's, there was also, um, there have even been statements from the Afghan Ministry of Foreign Affairs talking about an interest in being involved in CPEC, mm -hmm. in the China-Pakistan yeah. Economic Corridor and yeah in the Belt and Road Initiative and so on and so forth. But it's not really followed by much investment, much concrete action. Yeah. Now, one way in which we could read this is perhaps the thinking in Kabul is if we make these pronouncements, it will at least facilitate the idea or the understanding that Afghanistan is open and friendly for business. Mm. There's a sense of normality. And if the Chinese can come and invest and they've done it and we declare it, perhaps it will encourage other investors to come and invest. Mm -hmm. When it comes to CPEC, which isn't just in the realm of economics, but it's also pretty political, yeah. is it possible that this, you know, um, you know, a statement of interest in CPEC is relatively cheap politically? Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's driven by a rationale to sort of invite the West to not let the Afghans go entirely to the Chinese camp. 
Right. But these are these. This is ultimately just speculation. What we do know ultimately is that the implementation and concrete action following these agreements is very little. And I would speculate that up until the point that China is satisfied that the Taliban have taken sufficient action against Uyghur separatists, right. no real investment is going to be forthcoming. So tell me about that Uyghur connection, because of course um, this is something that uh, most Muslims find very unsavory about the Chinese, you know, the, the intense persecution, the annihilation actually of Islam in uh, China uh, and uh, you know, the concentration camps are, are pretty clear now that this is you know, state-sponsored um, genocide or cultural genocide against, against Muslims. What's the Taliban position towards that? I don't believe they have a position. Right. Um, I don't believe they have a position. Um, China will not invest in Afghanistan yeah. without its preconditions and requirements being fulfilled first, foremost amongst which are the presence, alleged or real, of Uyghur groups within Afghanistan with whom the Taliban has, at least in the 90s, had a friendly correspondence. Yeah. It's worth noting, however, that in the 1990s, Malaw Ahmad, for example, did meet Chinese diplomats. Okay. So they do have relations going back to that point in time. Secondly, however, I think it's important... I'm going to elucidate the Chinese perspective here. I'm not an expert on China, but... And this isn't to... Someone's going to say justification or whatever, but the Chinese perceive the Uyghur region as being the final nail in the coffin for them to realize their great aspiration toward becoming a state. Mm. And the presence of Muslim Uyghurs is considered an Achilles heel that could be set on fire mm. if, the, the, Americans, Americans. if yeah. the Americans wanted it. This right. is ultimately the rationale that's driving this. Mm. Now, correspondingly, we also need to analyze the Taliban's rationale. The rightness and wrongness of which mm. is beyond the scope of our discussion. When the Taliban look at themselves and they look at the region, they see Iran to the west, with whom they have some level of working relationship. They've arrived at a modus vivendi, mm -hmm. but of whom they're intensely suspicious mm -hmm. due to the sectarian schism. Yes. They see India, with whom the previous Afghan regime had pretty good relations, and they're amenable to the idea of a working relationship with India, but are careful to not be used by India as a pawn against Pakistan. Mm -hmm. To the north, they see the Central Asian states, which they, with whom they have a decent relationship, with the exception of Tajikistan, mm. but are still recovering from communism. Mm. Then they look at Pakistan, who, again, once again, the rightness and wrongness of these perceptions beyond the scope of our discussion, which is an unreliable ally, uh, ally if, if we can call it that, mm. or treacherous. So the they Taliban can't, see the, Pakistan. It, so. That that sentiment would probably be very prevalent amongst really? them. Okay. Treacherous at worst, unreliable at best, and the recent events with respect to Imran Khan and the army's role in all of that, mm -hmm. and how it pertains and correlates with Afghanistan and the drones coming in from Pakistani airspace into Afghanistan, there's a lot of baggage that goes into it. They look at Saudi, for example, and its shift away from Islamic politics. They don't see themselves as respond. There's, there's very little sense that they can do anything to alleviate the Uyghur issue. They can't go into the American camp for obvious reasons. They, they don't want to go into the Chinese camp yeah. for so obvious reasons. So whilst they may make blanket vague statements about solidarity with Palestine and oppressed Muslims everywhere, yeah. it's not probably not going to feature in terms of their relationship with the Chinese. Yeah. Having said that, the Chinese are not placated by that clearly okay. because the issue of Uyghur separatists in Afghanistan mm -hmm. is alluded to euphemistically in these joint declarations on counterterrorism. Right. Now, why would counterterrorism be mentioned otherwise? Okay. Antonio Guterres, uh, the Secretary General of the United, uh, United Nations, has uh, just this last week suggested that, uh, that Afghanistan is on the brink of a famine. It's the worst humanitarian disaster the world is about to face. So economically, uh, Afghanistan is in a very depressed state. Now, why is that? Is that down to the failure of the Taliban government? Is that a governance issue? I mean, the Taliban may have been great uh, freedom fighters, uh, heroes maybe, if we were to use that term. But when it comes to governance, they've uh, abjectly failed. Is that a fair criticism to make? 
I would say that Afghanistan has always been a poor country. In the early 1970s, we had a famine, an actual famine as well. So poverty in Afghanistan is unfortunately, like many other Muslim countries, the norm and not the exception. Going back decades, perhaps one could say even centuries. Um, the reasons for that poverty, of course, we, if we mention briefly, is the fact that Afghanistan traditionally surf, uh, served as a crossroads for trade. Trade that was redirected as India was incorporated into the Anglosphere and Central Asia was incorporated into the Russosphere. But there's another point here as well, which is that as per the preem one of the preeminent Afghan experts, Barnett Rubin, who actually also worked with the US Special Envoy to Afghanistan and Pakistan, Richard Holbrook, noted in his book or books repeatedly that the largest industries in Afghanistan, whilst it's traditionally considered to be an agricultural country, largest industries were as follows. Number one was raw. Number two was drugs, which was intimately linked with the war. Number three was agriculture. So the moment that war ended in Afghanistan, those who were aware knew that a massive economic depression was coming. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that I'd visited Afghanistan during the course of the occupation. I visited in 2017 and in 2017, there was economic contraction because of the fact that the American troops had largely withdrawn. They hadn't withdrawn in their entirety, but because they'd largely withdrawn, the fall in demand in the economy had actually caused quite a chronic, chronic shortage, which correspondingly went along with a reduction in aid that went to Afghanistan and interest. So the question then becomes, after trillions of dollars, and this has been verified by numerous sort of sources, trillions of dollars spent in Afghanistan, and before the ink is even dry on the American military occupation, the country is in an economic depression, mm. is, is an economic freefall, not, not even a depression, a freefall is probably a more accurate way to put it. Can we blame that on the Taliban? The only feasible way in which I can say that is that while the Taliban fought a war, war destroys economies, at least in peacetime, in wartime there's obviously the war economy, but were the Taliban the only one engaging in war? Absolutely not. So I think the burden of accountability fundamentally needs to come here. And the onus of criticism needs to be on the side with the greater resources and the greater power, which is the United States. 20 years, trillions of dollars spent in an Afghan economy that up until its very final breath was dependent and sustained solely by foreign aid. Do you feel that the um, United States is punishing the Taliban and punishing Afghanistan for its defeat. So it doesn't recognize uh, the Afghan government. It withholds aid. Um, it has levied punitive economic sanctions on the country. Is this a punishment you feel from the US? I believe, I think if we look at, as I res referred to earlier, with respect to global media, the infrastructure and underpinning the narrative on Afghanistan remains intact. Mm. One of the things that we see in global media's coverage in Afghanistan is essentially, aha, we told you so. Right. Right? Look at how bad Afghanistan is now. And this is why the occupation was necessary. Right. And I think a similar rationale can be observed in the American policy toward Afghanistan, whereby, quite frankly, and once again, this isn't to justify the Biden administration's decision making, but if you are the Biden administration, do you want the Taliban to be good or successful Taliban? Okay. Absolutely not. Mm. Because there's an inverse relationship there or there's a negative correlation where one's legitimacy increases, the other's decreases. So if the Taliban prove themselves to be adept at governance, at economic management, at economic development, what would that say about the American endeavor and presence over the past two decades? Mm. It's very natural that the Americans would not want Afghanistan or the Taliban to succeed under the current circumstances. So I, I, I feel, yes, absolutely, there is a spirit, spirit of, uh, of punitive sanctions being uh, levied against Afghanistan. Um, but at the same time, I think there's also the understanding that some level of engagement is needed with respect to alleviating or drip feeding Afghanistan aid so that it doesn't fall into famine, but not so that it becomes the next Switzerland.
Finally, um, Ahmed, I mean, this has been a really fascinating interview. and we've, It's been really wide range, alhamdulillah, and I've, I've got a really a greater impression, I think, of the country from our, from our discussion. But often I find, I mean, yes, we see it in the Western press, but often when I see commentators on Afghanistan from Afghanistan, they're quite hopeless at this stage. And they think that, you know, the country's lost and it's maybe lost for a generation or two. Uh, from your perspective, do you have hope that your country, Afghanistan, a country which all Muslims, of course, will have, you know, some affinity to by the mere fact that these are believers, these are Muslims. Uh, do you think that Afghanistan will improve uh, in our lifetime? The fundamental ingredient for prosperity, for development, for an upward trajectory mm -hmm. is peace. We saw that over the course of two decades, a military occupation that at its height had something like 150,000 American troops equipped with the best gear, the best army the world has ever seen, trillions of dollars, 20 years. But with the absence of the fundamental ingredient of peace, we saw how the Afghan economy was in free fall before the Americans even left. We have peace now in Afghanistan. Is it enough? Absolutely not but it is the fundamental and the first step. And if we become hopeless, there are challenges, absolutely. There are hurdles in the way, absolutely. There are challenges both at home and abroad. We've discussed, you know, the Amer sanctions, punitive measures toward Afghanistan. We've discussed, let's say, stubborn policy making. We've discussed, discussed bad policies, counterproductive policies, but we have peace, right? So, in, in spite of all of those other things, if we have peace, if we don't have hope, as Afghans especially, we don't really have much else. Because as a country and as a society, even in the absence of the American occupation, what Afghanistan suffered under the Soviet occupation, we would still not have recovered from. Even in the absence, let's say from 1989 onward, up until now, in a hypothetical world that Afghanistan was a land of peace, we would still be recovering from the Soviet occupation. Because to some extent, we could describe their modus operandi with respect to military operations as genocidal, as trying to break the back of the rural countryside, of trying to sabotage any agricultural production. With all of these hurdles, right, but we now have peace. And with peace and with hope, and with du'a and tawakkul in, in Allah, maybe we, we may live to see another day where Afghanistan actually rises and does become a peaceful and prosperous country. If we don't have peace and we throw our hands up in the air and just complain and don't attempt to engage constructively with our country, with the government of our country, flawed as it may be, we don't really have much else. Ahmed, Jazakallah Khair, on that very uh, positive note, uh, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much for having me, Jar. Lovely to be here. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website thinkinmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah Khair.